All righty, I think I'm ready to start. What do you guys think? Good. Yep. Go ahead. Go All on. righty. Well, welcome everybody. This is our big first um, Tableau Florida user group. So normally we've been doing Orlando ones every month. Um, and so we're lucky to have everybody here at this time and expand it out. And we have a lot of neat things in store for 2022. Um, first off, want to say thank you to everybody on this screen, as well as all of you for joining and everybody that's given us feedback throughout the year and in the past months and weeks and everything. Um, this is our leadership committee. So we have Aaron, Andrew, Erica, Jeff, um, I'm Katie, and then Yamil on the phone as well. And you can always reach us at orlandotug at gmail.com. Forgot to put that on here. Um, our promise for this going year is to have monthly events. Um, a lot of this is new to our people that have been joining us lately throughout 2021. So we're looking to have virtual hybrid and in person as a mix for this year. Um, we're looking at growing Tableau within the state, within Orlando, but across the state as well as data visualization. Um, we're looking at providing monthly speakers, networking opportunities, giving everybody a platform. So if you have things you want to share, visualizations, things you've learned, um, different techniques, whatever, like we would love to have you guys present. And then it's a place to share job opportunities and just network and make that career growth and inspiration. Um, normally we have a job board that we include in our slides. We don't have one this month, just as we expand more to the state but definitely um, feel free to send them in and we can add them to the slide deck or post them in our LinkedIn group. And then new this year, we're looking at giving back to the community. Um, so this could be community service events um, in person, or it could be uh, partnering with nonprofits in the area or across the state. And so how can we, you know, like help with the visualizations, Tableau, um, analytics, all of that type of work. And coming up, we'll go ahead and tease these. Next month, we have our virtual event planned. Um, I don't have the date on hand, but we have Pablo Lopez will be joining us from um, London. And if you guys have a chance, please check out his Tableau public profile. He also has a website. Um, he's on all of his social media. And he has a really great um, resume or portfolio of visualizations out there and has been featured a lot on Tableau public. In March, we're going to have an in-person event in Orlando. Um, we're still working on the details of that. And then in April, we have Kevin Flairledge. Um, he's one of the Tableau twins. Um, you probably have seen as Tableau Zen Masters or in the Tableau community. And so um, we will get you all of those links and definitely stay tuned for those events. And then staying connected, we're trying to be in a lot of places. So we have our LinkedIn group. Um, if you search Orlando Tableau, that is, or the Orlando Tableau user group, that's where you can find our local Orlando group. Um, you can email the leadership at that email address, orlandotug at gmail.com. On Twitter, we have a couple different handles. And then our event pages where you can RSVP for other user groups coming up. Did I miss anything? Probably. Um, otherwise, Yamil, I'm gonna pass it to you if you wanna introduce our presenter today. So here from the phone, uh, you can hear me, right? Yep. Katie? Good. So here, you know, what can you say? I mean, we have such a privilege to have one more time, Steve Wexler, great, great friend of Florida, great friend of the W Orlando user group. Uh, you know, he's the one and only, he's the, he's the man. I mean, the guy that, you know, brought us amazing books, uh, check out his books, his profile, survey data. I mean, you name it. Um, thank you, Steve, for being here with us. We know that this is going to be great for, for the talk for the Florida, uh, members here, uh, talking about data visualization. You always have incredible topics, incredible themes. Check out his website, datarevelations.com and, we we'll welcome you one more time. Thank you for doing this. I mean, great to start the year with you. And we're working hard for, for so you get, everybody knows about, you know, bringing amazing individuals like Steve uh, that have so much to share about data visualization. Thank you, Steve, for being here and let's go through it.
Great. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. What a great group this has uh, uh, become. Um, I yeah. remember, I think, visiting three, four years ago and, and outstanding leadership. Um, confession, this is the first time I am doing this presentation. I've never done this one before. So um, consider yourself either um, you are lucky, hopefully good lucky and not bad lucky within that respect. So let's get started. Let me share my screen and let's see how this goes. Also, thank you. Very and much. I'm trusting that you are seeing this properly and you're not seeing presenter view or something like that. So uh, broadly, this is what you should do and when you should do it. Some suggestions on when to use data visualization, storytelling, infographics, and dashboards. Hold on one second. I need to get just one item queued up and there we go. So thanks for that introduction, Yamil. I'm the founder, principal, sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was a really long time ago. I'm a Tableau Zen Master Hall of Famer. I am the co-host of Chart Chat, which was data literacy's um, most interesting podcast of last year, even though it's not really a podcast, it's a live stream thing. And I'm certainly proud of all these endeavors within data visualization, but the two things I'm most proud of is one being one of the three authors of the big book of dashboards, along with Jeff Schaefer and Andy Cotgreave, and being the author of The Big Picture. And a lot of stuff that you're going to see today comes from The Big Picture. Any of you who have participated in a workshop or presentation know that I show some derivative of this slide, which is you are encouraged to disagree with me. Good stuff happens when we debate these things. So something not resonating, you think there's a better example, you think I'm full of crap, I'd actually like to hear that or via chat. I can't really monitor chat now, but during the Q&A. So take a note, feel free to pipe in later. All right, um, data visualization versus data storytelling. Boy, that term data storytelling has become white hot at the moment and everyone is discussing this. And well, what's the difference between the two? And I got a very good distillation of this from this book, Effective Data Storytelling from Brent Dykes. He's now become a pretty good friend and colleague. But if I were to try to distill his entire book into a sentence, which means you don't have to buy it. No, you should buy it. You use data visualization to discover insights, insights that you might never see without the data being visualized. You use data storytelling to communicate those insights. So I'm going to try to come up with an A, B type of thing that puts these things together. This is a data visualization from Washington State, seven day rolling average of COVID cases. Sorry, how could we not have a presentation and not involve COVID at some point? This is data visualization. Now I'm adding some storytelling to it. This comes from the brilliant epidemiologist and author Carl T. Bergstrom, and in particular this part here, and you know maybe might've made this a big title up here, when a seven day, well, you can read that on your own, but the, um, apparently my dog, I don't know if you can hear, it doesn't like this uh, analysis one bit. But just this adding of this annotation layer it takes what, well, here's a graphic, here's a data visualization. Oh, now I'm going to curate it to some degree. I'm going to add something, uh, uh, some author commentary. I'm going to put some nuance around it or some narrative around it. All right. Well, what are infographics? And I had already committed to doing this presentation and I realized, you know, can you actually define what an infographic is? And, and I kept coming back to this guy, Justice Potter Stewart, um, Supreme Court decision in 1964 about obscenity and to which he said, I know it when I see it. And that's not really going to service you too well, which is, yeah, an infographic, you know, uh, that's not an infographic that is. Well, what distinguishes it? And I looked at a fine book called Cool Infographics uh, written by Randy Crum. Um, he runs a bunch of data visualization meetups. And I even called him up and said, hey, this is from your book from five, six years ago. Have you modified it at all? He said, no, he stands by it. But when you think about an infographic, 
It's kind of a, a larger graphic design that combines data visualization, illustrations, text, and images together into a format that tells the complete story. I would say it is a type of data storytelling. The entire story can be encapsulated in the infographic versus a presentation that, that goes in sequence. It's not a curated presentation, it's a single thing. And also, in almost invariably, these infographics, they're not for clearly defined audience. So often you have to do something that's gonna grab people's attention. And I'm gonna go to one that Stephen Few, uh, hopefully a lot of you know who Stephen Few is. Um, he writes the, or wrote the blog Perceptual Edge, um, wrote Now You See It, um, 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 show me the numbers. He's, he's, he doesn't like frothy graphics for sure. He's definitely a, a bar chart kind of guy. And he took exception to this rather sprawling infographic. I'm only showing half of it here. Why we still need women's equality day, 95 years after women got the right to vote. And here we're looking at the representation in the Supreme Court at the time. And here's in Congress. So here we have this kind of um, isotype or pictogram. Here we have a stack bar chart. Here we have a pie chart. Um, here we have a waffle chart. Here we have, I don't know, a chair chart, et cetera. And he thought, boy, this is a lot of information. It's hard to do the comparison, but it does grab your attention and it looks interesting. So here, here was his attempt at this. And, and, and you'll notice there's some curated stuff here. You know, there's some text up here. There's the uh, uh, a catchy title. This was my way of visualizing it and seeing very clearly where the 50-50 was and that in governorship we're way ahead. But in voters, there are actually way more women voters than men voters. Let me show you someone who straddled the line rather brilliantly. So I would say that this is that this is a good, clear infographic, and if it's in a magazine, it's probably going to capture your attention. This is a quick sketch done by Alberto Cairo, and he's the first to acknowledge, "Hey, you know, the guy looks like he's holding a gun or a boomerang or something like that." But he did a really nice job of making the comparisons easy to see where where. Uh, women are grossly underrepresented, but he did kind of couch it with a cool title, cool colors, and these images that might grab your attention. So here's the kind of sprawling thing, and then here is what might be considered a righteous infographic. By the way, I tend to be a real purist and keep it as simple as possible and succinct as possible. But I love this uh, that came out towards, I guess, end of November or December. This is one of my favorite graphics of all of last year from McKinsey and Company. If cows were a country, they would be among the top greenhouse gas emitters. And, and tell me this isn't going to stop and get your attention, which is kind of one of the challenges of an infographic. You should not be feeling that if you are presenting within a corporate environment. Something is wrong if you feel you have to attract people. If you have to attract people, it means you're not giving them good information. In any case, so I've done data visualization, a little bit about data storytelling. I've tried to describe a little bit about infographics. Well, why do you even need dashboards? Ask the guy who co-authored a book about dashboards. So, um, a little over five years ago, just before the big book of dashboards came out, I attended one of Cole Nussbaumer and Affleck's presentations, one of her workshops. Um, she uses and, and went through it and wondering, gosh, why does anybody need my book? Her, her book is so great. These curated presentations are so great. And she had a wonderful metaphor in describing how much work it can take to present just one really good finding. And I'm gonna paraphrase. You have to shuck a lot of oysters to find a single pearl. In your presentations, don't show all the shells that you shucked, just show the pearl. And a, a, a feeling of delight came over me at some point in the, her workshop. And that was, I hear somebody typing, if you could mute yourself, please. Thank you. 
the, oh, now I have to start all over again. Where was I? The, um, what came, I realized, oh my gosh, a, a dashboard can be this wonderful automated oyster shucker. It can really help you find where the stories are. Now that's one use for it. The other is there are some times where your curated presentation just isn't gonna do the job for you. So let me show you an example of where the dashboard can help you find the things that you then want to make into a story or into an infographic. And I'm gonna be citing uh, Makeover Monday quite a bit. I'm sorry to see that that is no longer in existence. It's something created by Andy Kreeble a while back, but he would find a data set, he and, and Andy Cotgreave and then Eva Murray and uh, others who have helped him with this over, I think, a five, six year period would find a data set that's out in the wild and the data visualization that went with it and then said, hey, why don't you try this? See if you can come up with something better. If the world were 100 people portrait, and this was the visualization that piqued his interest, and I'm not going to critique it at this point. Here are some examples of what people came up with. Uh, this is from Carl Alchin. This is from uh, Michael Mixon playing with the number 100. And I go back to my colleagues and my definition of what a dashboard is. And, and, and by the way, we've been kind of beaten up over this dashboard, because over this definition, because it's not refined enough. But I love it. A dashboard is a visual display of data used to monitor conditions and or facilitate understanding and or facilitate understanding. Notice I'm not getting into the whole confusion. Is it an explanatory dashboard or an exploratory dashboard? Is it interactive or is it static? I'm just saying it's here to help you monitor what's going on or maybe help you better understand the data so you can do something that maybe is not a dashboard with it. So let me show you what I came up with. Said, let me help, let me understand the data. I wouldn't necessarily even call this a dashboard. It's just a chart. And I made a bar chart where I divided all the different categories. If the world were by age, by area, by um, having a college degree, by gender, et cetera, and found myself interested in this. Oh my gosh, you know, 63 out of 100 have adequate nutrition, but one out of 100 is starving. Now, let me show you armed with that type of information what someone with a real design flair can do. And this comes from uh, Athen Mafratonis. And I think it's really striking. And, but it started with first understanding the data and then thinking, well, yes, but I don't know if that's going to tug at somebody necessarily. So maybe a different depiction of this would work better. And I think he did, just did an absolutely incredible job here. So use one for dashboards is the automated um, oyster shucking or finding where there are important things in your data that may not have revealed themselves easily. The other is the case for more than one chart and interactivity. This comes from a real uh, hedge fund dashboard. Uh, showing different sectors and profitability by um, each of the funds that are in each of the sector. And you can see, hey, you know, real, a lot of profitability here and woo, a lot of volatility here, a bunch of things that are highly profitable and a bunch of things that are messed up. Well, to tell the whole story, I don't want to see just the individual funds and how they stack up. I need to say overall, as problematic as this was, it was still profitable. Well, now you're just showing me a summary of the sectors, but maybe I want to look at individual funds. Okay, so I, I can't get at everything I need in just one chart. I need several of them. And I can't help but wonder about, man, this sector K, it's got some big winners and some big losers. I want to, oh, sorry, I forgot about the big ass numbers up at the top that kind of uh, summarize all this and explain what the different colors mean. Blue means profitable, orange means unprofitable. But I want some interactivity so I can just say, I just want to see which things contribute to sector K, which funds. And I can see it's got the two worst performers, but it still managed to be profitable. So this interactivity and this more than one chart, yeah, you kind of need these things. 
The other is I'm a huge believer in making it as easy as possible for my stakeholders to get the information that they need. And it may mean curating some results for them. So maybe you've gone through some stuff ahead of time and said, here are the top 10 most interesting things that are happening in the organization this month. And we think this is fantastic. Copiers and faxes have gone from second worst to fourth best. And you make the presentation and someone says, hey, that's great, but I wanna know about tables. I wanna know about electronics. I wanna know about a different category. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen um, the people create a deck that has 500 slides in it, which is, which is, you know, Geneva Convention is in the case that's cruel and unusual punishment. Why are there 500 slides? So that every possible permutation, oh, I wanna look at this product for this region. No, I wanna look at this product for this region, et cetera, which is, come up with the you know, top five or 10 things. And then if there's a question you can't answer, be armed with your trusty dashboard and go, oh, that's a really great question. I hadn't anticipated that someone would wanna know about it. Let me show you how, you can, how we can answer this and many other questions whenever you want in case my curated presentation didn't answer all the questions you have. In any case, I think a good dashboard can help you find really good stories. And I'm going to say something that I think may be a little um, controversial. I think it's okay to have a boring dashboard. I'm, yeah, I want one that's beautiful. And, but the I don't think there's anything that's going to be inherently exciting or have this emotional component. But the presentation about the findings from that dashboard, that should be riveting. And we're welcome to debate this a little later on. All right, I do want to discuss things about some of the individual, uh, some a lot of the visualizations that are out in the wild. And 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 I just said, you know, it's hard to get excited about a boring dashboard. Now, a, a presentation based on a finding could be really exciting, but most dashboards they're just don't have this visual panache that you'll see in certain things. And I have a confession, I am very intimidated by a lot of the stuff I see people making, either in Tableau or uh, Adobe Illustrator or D3 or whatever. I mean, this was created by uh, Johnny Walker a number of years ago. And I'm thinking, does he even use the same tool I use? I can't make anything like this. Or uh, Michael Kisneros, absolutely. Uh, exceptional, this amazing thing um, from Ludovic uh, Tavernier. And then this is, I think, Jeff Schaefer's favorite dashboard. This is not done in Tableau. This is from Georgia Lupi. And it was done in, well, I'm not sure what you use, but I su uh, suspect Illustrator. And I want to talk about, you know, some of the and unintended consequences of some of the things around Makeover Monday. And I think it's great for people to experiment with stuff. So the idea is a data set that's out in the wild. And how would you visualize this? And the idea is that between spring of 2015 and 2017, um, a bunch of the, the Snapchat has become really popular among teams. Is this the best way to show it? And we're off to the races. Here's a version of this from uh, Mafouj Khan. And this one comes from Corey Jones, who's an Iron Viz competitor, by the way. And it is, this is a native chart to Power BI, by the way. It's called a ribbon chart. He's using a technique that was developed by um, uh, Roddy Zakovich. And he called this technique an area bump chart, ribbon chart, area bump chart. I got to tell you, whenever I see it, it just reminds me of the Beatles and Yellow Submarine. But just look at this for a moment and know that the technique here was developed by Roddy Zakovich. This one is getting more into the, hey, we're really trying to make it clear that snapshot got higher. Why not just do a simple line chart? And this one is the one that wins the day for me. Oh my gosh, look at that Snapchat went from all the way down here to all the way up here. And I want to, you to see who made this. Hold on, I'm gonna zoom in on this. Can I see that? The guy who developed the 
area bump chart technique. Just because you can create an area bump chart doesn't mean you have to. Look what he created. Simple, clear, outstanding job. All right, another item. What companies are the most profitable? This is how much money each of these companies makes per second. Apple makes $1,444.76 each second. In the time it's taken me to tell you that they've already made $25,000, excuse me, $27,000, $29,000 in profit. By the way, if you can read this chart and understand it, man, you, you have exceptional abilities. All right, world, what would you do with this? Ah, love this. Nice, simple, straightforward, uh, Zach Geis bar chart, super easy to make the comparisons, and highlighting Apple leads by a wide margin. Love this version from Curtis Harris, came up with a really compelling mobile way of showing it. And I want to show you one of my favorite practitioners in the field, Philip Riggs. Um, he is also a cartoonist. So he kind of did a really nice infographic treatment with this, which is he wanted, he was more interested in the areas that appeal to him, which is uh, uh, pharmacolog pharmaceuticals. So came up with this kind of um, guide um, rolling on a pill. He highlighted the item that was most important to him. He has some commentary about it and a cool title. This definitely falls into the infographic, but without compromising the visual integrity of this. Bravo. Now, let me show you a version of this that was done by Mark Bradburn. Now, this is when Mark was just a mere mortal. He's now uh, an employee of Tableau, and I just adore him and adore, adore his work. And he's doing this really great initiative called Real World Fake Data. But this is what he came up with for this. And, and, and everyone went gaga over this, went, oh, that's so cool. I got to make something that looks like this. And I remember when I first saw it going, well, that's not what the title should be, what the most profitable companies make per second. That's what the title should be, North Korean ballistic missile tests. And right around the same time he did this, and he's just experimenting, he wanted to try something. But this got so much attention, you know, all these different likes and people retweeting. That same week, New York Times published this, what teenagers are learning from online porn. And my concern was people are seeing everyone going crazy about this. They're thinking, oh, I guess I should be making a chart like this when I have this type of data. Oh, I guess this is the way I'm supposed to behave when I'm intimate. And, and, it's, and it's, oh my gosh, no, you, you should not be learning from this. By the way, it didn't help that, that for a while Tableau had its own viz porn on its website. This was like the home screen or a piece of the home screen. And that looks really cool, doesn't it? You know, this nice area chart. I defy you to learn anything from this chart. It just looks cool. So you're wondering, you see this and these things and all these cool things people are creating. And well, what are you supposed to do? And should I be doing an infographic? Should it be storytelling? Should it be a, a, a dashboard? And I want to discuss sort of the design pressures I will feel on stuff. And well, how badass does this thing need to be? How amazing. And you know, if it's just for me, it can be really simple. This is helping me do my work or it's helping my work group. No, oh, it's for the whole department. Ooh, it's for the senior executives. There needs to be a certain polish on this, et cetera. For me, by far the hardest assignment I get is when I'm working with a, a client and the dashboards and visualizations they're creating are embedded as part of the product. It's customer facing. So it's a direct reflection of the company. The general public where you've got to create something and capture their attention, think a cool graphic in Wired Magazine or that McKinsey and company if cows were a country uh, type of thing. This feeling that this has to be amazing I don't live here. I don't, I don't live in that world. And 
And I've got to say, if you're creating stuff for internal communication, most of the time, you probably aren't going to have that pressure, that a pressure that I have to attract people and then inform them and engage them and persuade them. I think you're probably living here, inform, engage, and persuade. But by all means, make your visualization attractive. It doesn't mean you know it can't be beautiful, but you're probably not going to have to, oh my God, what am I going to do to stop them from turning between page 13 and page 14? I would say the absolute overarching thing that should always be um, driving you. And I'm going to show this to you twice. Always be thinking, who is your audience? What's the message? And for the largest member, number of people in that audience, you are here to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. If you're doing that, if you have your audience in mind and are trying to make it as simple as possible for them to grasp something, then you will succeed. It doesn't mean making something simplistic. There's a big difference between simple and simplistic. And it doesn't mean be some narrative that's going on. So I want to show you some data visualization storytelling examples. These are all come from the, the relatively new book, The Big Picture. And let me set up the first one. This comes from Cole Nussbaumer Naflick and, and the uh, author of Storytelling with Data. And the owner of the firm by the same name. A mythical pharmacist, this is actually a real case study, but we've had to change the names. Uh, the pharmaceutical company Universa concluded a marketing study comparing their recently FDA approved anti-anxiety drug, Mercolax, to their primary competitors. The study included patient participants who had taken both Mercolax and the competitor product for a set period of time. The results showed that people really like Mercolax a, mark, a lot more than the competition. So this is the slide they had, what they were trying to use to convince people. And by the way, th there's, there's a, th no one got it. No one the, in the audience, it's actually audiences got it. They were confused. People actually thought people preferred the competitor. The killer chart that shows this was buried amongst all this other stuff. So they realized they had to define the audience. Cole was working with this group and they realized it wasn't an audience. There were two wildly different audiences. One were psychiatrists who would be in a live presentation, like a lunch and learn, and uh, you know, sitting over a meal while someone is presenting. And the other were um, sales reps that had like a minute or two in a doctor's office to try to convince them. And here are the two different visualizations they came up with. But that's the completed story on the left. The one slide on the right, yeah, that worked for the sales call. But let me explain how the first one was put together. So you had someone presenting this said, consider a square. Imagine a single uh, square represents a patient in the study. There were 99 patients in the study, 10 didn't have a preference, 70 people preferred Mercolax, 19 people preferred the competitor. And this narrative of step-by-step -step walking people through the thing, now you can already see, oh yeah, I can see there's way more blue than the other stuff. Of the people who liked our product, 34 people cited lack of mood swings, 29 People cited better anxiety relief, and the rest said there was some other reason. And this person built the thing. So this incredibly confusing chart at the beginning became, oh, I get it. And I can see the details of this thing. And I get it. There's way more blue than green. Um, I guess the blue uh, prescription medication is better. In the case of the sales reps, I'm, I'm still questioning why this wasn't done as a, a bar chart over here, but this was, hey, 71% like us, 19% like them. And the impact was immediately seen. They didn't get weird questions on sales calls or presentations, and they started selling. Uh, the drug became more popular thing to sell. Well, when I saw this and Cole had presented it to me, 
the first thing I said, well, why don't you just do this as a bar chart? And I want to introduce you to my friend and colleague and co-author, Andy Cotgreave and Cotgreave's Law. And the longer an innovative visualization exists, the probability someone says it should have been a line or bar chart approaches one. And that is the first thing I did. Look, this bar is so much bigger. Why not do it this way? Oh, you wanted to have it show like it's like individuals? Make it a unit chart. Oh, you want to make it look like people? Make it look like people. And Cole said, we tried all these things, but we knew how this stuff would play out. We knew how the audience would like the seduction. So we went with the waffle chart. Now, they started with, with a data visualization or a dashboard that made it easy to understand the data. And for this audience, they decided to go with a not that often used chart. By the way, the waffle chart can be very powerful with sparse data. Uh, here's something from Lindsay Poulter, which really brings out the underrepresentation of Black people, Black CEOs on the Fortune 2020, Fortune 500 list. So it's not something I use often, but certain use cases for it. And I'm going to show you another case of one of these. Why didn't you just use a bar chart? And well, this is a case where maybe accurate comparisons weren't necessary. So this comes from our friend, Greg Lewandowski, who has been in the Tableau community for a very long time. And he was getting requests to, hey, show us our top 10 customers, our top 25 customers, and said, well, why do you want to see the top 10 or top 25? And no one had an answer. It was, well, isn't that what everybody does? He decided to look at there are 25,000 partners that they had, 25,000. And he was astounded to discover that out of 25,000, nine of them made up 25% of their income. And he wanted to think about how can I get this across to people so that they realize we have 25,000 partners, but only a handful of them are, are really make a big difference for us. So he started with this. There are 25,000 dots. 25% of our income comes from this. 75% of income comes from this. Why do we have so many partners? Or were these amazing partners here, were they always, you know, did, was there a time when they weren't such a great partner? What did they do to become a better partner? And, and, the same thing with Cotgreaves Law. If you were to ask me, how many times out of 100 should I use a bar or a line chart for something eye-catching? I would say 99 times out of 100 use the bar or the line, maybe one out of 100 do the thing that's eye-catching. The reason this works is I don't need to make an accurate comparison here. I don't need to see it's 1,800 times as much versus 1,743 times as much. Uh, by the way, this was known as the uh, uh, the impact was was sort of shock and awe. It was known as the jawbreaker um, uh, visualization because that's what happened when people's jaws hit the table after seeing this. All right, I'm going to show you an example, and I've I've I have um, uh, trotted this out on a couple of occasions. Uh, just because it, it had a profound influence on my uh, way of looking at, at how potent a simple data visualization can be. And I'm going to go with something um, that isn't, you know, this weird 25,000 dots for a waffle chart. Let me give you the setup for it. And it's mostly data visualization and a little bit of data storytelling. So it's the year um, 2014. I'm working with a major healthcare company. They have data on thousands of companies and millions of people. These are um, uh, you know, people who are uh, you know, part of a, a healthcare system. And so it's employees and their families. And the goal was to save costs and save lives through compliance. Compliance, not just exercise and diet, but making sure people are taking the meds when they need to take it, possibly weaning themselves um, uh, off of certain medications. How can we get buy-in that there's a problem that they that this organization recognizes we have a problem in our organization? So 
In this case, they were targeting an organization that had a very high level of, of diabetes in the organization compared to peer organizations. By the way, in other parts of the world, this would be considered 18.5%, might be considered very low incidence of diabetes. But in this case, there were like 800, 900 other companies. And this company with the 18.5% incidence of diabetes amongst family and uh, amongst employees and family was very high. This slide didn't get any action didn't get people to go, all right, we kind of we kind of get it. So instead we created a, a series of slides. So we started with this. There are 790 different organizations, each represented by a dot. Dots down here are organizations with low incidence of diabetes, dots up here, high incidence. But we jittered the dots because it's hard to see there are 790 things. And you can now see, wow, there's very few that are up here, but there's a lot down here. And then we drew a line that says, here's where the worst 1% is. Anything above this line, you are the most unenviable of outliers. Here's where you are. And to this day, it is probably the most... Um, it was the first case for me, and so I remember it so well, where I saw a data visualization um, really have an impact on an audience. They really got it. They saw, I can see 790 things, and I can see just how much we are outside where we should be. And, and it was such a powerful feeling. It was, oh my gosh, I want to do this again and again and again. How can I? And, and there's nothing complicated here. It's just the position of a dot from a common baseline. It's just dots. And, and we just made sure to you know, indicate where the good, the bad, and the ugly is with this. And we just spread the dots out so people could see them. So there's, there, there isn't anything amazing or terribly complicated going on. So I, I do want to go back to some other guidelines as you're trying to figure all this stuff out. And then I will try to put visualization dashboards, infographics, data store telling in. So as you're tempted to make something that looks like this, uh, some useful guidelines and I'm a big fan of the far side. And this is one of my favorite cartoons. First pants, then your shoes. And as you are tempted to make something that blows people away with how uh, beautiful your work is, get the aha right first. And when the aha is right, you can add the ooh ah. And I've seen this, I have a whole nother presentation where people really emphasize this and they ended up horribly confusing and in some cases, uh, tragically misleading their audience because it was all about the ooh ah. So please make sure you know who your audience is. And I'm gonna show you a wonderful quote that I only came about recently. It's from Ken Hamer, who is um, a presentation researcher and manager at AT&T. This quote is from at least 20, 25 years ago. Designing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. Now, to an extent I have, um, I'm a little hypocritical. Maybe I would have spent more time with Yamir and, and other people on the leadership team here. To, to, hey, I had a pretty good sense of the Orlando tug and I have presented before, but you know, maybe with a little effort, a little more effort and probing, I might've come up with some things I would have tuned that would make this a better presentation. In any case, you've got to know your audience and what's important to them. What's the message? And you are here to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. And, and just one more overarching thing as you're creating stuff, you want to show, I have no problem with you using your Tableau portfolio, Tableau public to show off. Make over Monday or any of these other things, go ahead and show off. But when you're creating something for a particular audience, are you helping your audience or are you showing off how smart you are? And I have hurt myself when I'm trying to show off how smart I am. All right, just to get back to where all these pieces fit together and where you can learn more about them. And yeah, I'll have some kind of plugging of my own stuff. But kind of the foundation of all of this is visualization. We don't have data storytelling 
you can have data storytelling without visualization, but um, I would say the best data stories I've seen somewhere have some component of data visualization in them. And a dashboard is just an, a type of data visualization or combining one or more data visualizations to help you monitor conditions and or find really interesting stories. How you convey that information, well, that's where the data storytelling is. And we saw examples of two types, a curated presentation or, and I wouldn't say an infographic is the next level. An infographic is really an example of a type of storytelling where everything is encapsulated in one place. And, and this can be hard because the audience is not clearly defined. So where can you learn more about data visualization? There are a lot of books on this and I've just come out with one. It is short and it's, I'd like to think it is entertaining and it is geared towards the practitioner. It's mostly geared towards people who may never create a chart or graph, but need to be able to use and understand them. I'm trying to get people to appreciate all the stuff that you are doing. Dashboards, the first book that uh, I worked on with Andy and Jeff. For data storytelling, also lots of good books, but I would say the first one that comes to mind and one of my favorites is Storytelling with Data. And for infographics, I really like Randy's book, Cool Infographics, a great deal. So just as this was the first time I've done this presentation, I'm going to tell you about the first time I'm doing a new workshop based on the big picture. So I'm doing this March 3rd. It's virtual. There's the URL for it. You will all get it. Anyone that attends will get a copy of the big picture. And there's the URL for it. If somebody can uh, um, be kind enough to type into the chat, I can do it after when, you know, stop sharing this big pick dot me front slash CC big pick. And I hope you avail yourself of that. And to continue the discussion, I'd love to hear from you. Website is data revelations. That's my email and that's my Twitter handle. And uh, I've either here or after the fact, I'd be delighted to uh, banter with you about stuff. So why don't we I stop sharing and let's open this up. And I don't know who wants to curate the questions. Uh, yeah, Yamil, I know that there were some that had already come in ahead of time. And I can see you successfully got your laptop working. Congratulations there. Um, but I'm happy to open this up and but don't know how you want to um, uh, monitor it, so to speak. Yes, yeah, so there were there were some questions. I don't know. Is there any questions, uh, Jeff or Katie, in the chat right now? You no, know, we can ask uh, Steve some of the questions. No questions in the chat. No questions. Hey, okay. um, Jennifer, you're asking. Can you get a copy of the slide deck? I'm. I will have. I'm, I can provide a PDF. Yeah, so there were some questions that some uh, some of the individuals that are here sent us ahead of time. And I really like this question. I, I actually wanted to know myself, uh, how did a musician got involved in data visualization? Well, are you asking that of, of, of um, so, so, we, so I'm gonna share something again. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, you know, you could be asking the same question of Jeff Schaefer. Um, yeah. Jeff Schaefer has a master's in music. I have a master's degree in music. Um, uh, and, and in fact, it was a data visualization that Jeff did, uh, quantified self data visualization that, that went, oh my gosh, I got to meet this guy because he had a sand key and uh, uh, emerging from his, um, the bell of his trumpet. And I just thought it was so brilliant. But hold on one second, and then I will show you something that's just annoying the crap out of me about Tableau right now, and can put some pressure on them. Um, uh, so let me just share the screen, and then I, this is a really long-winded way of answering your question. But all right, I'm sharing my screen. This is Data Revelations. If you go to the About page, 
Hopefully this will cooperate. And I've kind of got my, you know, my, my history here. And um, by the way, I did my master's at University of Miami. So I awesome. spent a couple of years down, down there. And the really how I got into this was, well, I needed to make, you know, supplement a very meager living as a musician. Here's the thing um, that I'm pissed off about. The, um, uh, this viz in a tool tip thing. Um, so you, the, the, this is a visualization inside a tool tip. But if I hover over, what the heck is happening there? That's working. That's not working. And if you have a dual axis chart um, and the, the filters for a visualization in a tool tip isn't working properly, and this is a bug they introduced in 2021.4, they are aware of the problem and hopefully will have a fix soon. So in any case, um, I got into computers and technology uh, as a way to um, buttress my income and then kind of did that full time for a while. And then I've since gotten back into music, but considerably more as a hobby than as a profession. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, there was another really good question that someone sent that said, how have KPIs and the types of visualizations changed during pandemic? Or is there anything that you see that the pandemic have done to like, you know, changing any way type visualizations or KPIs or any different need out of the pandemic? Well, the, the, there are two chart types that really became uh, mm. mainstream. One which is highly useful for business and another that I said, well, this will never show up in business and then became critical to understanding COVID. The first type of chart is the index chart, where events that don't start at the same time, you can you, you compare as if they started at the same time. Uh, I hate to re visit such difficult uh, times with folks, but you may remember when COVID first came to the United States, it first hit Italy. And we're going, okay, well, Italy is 45 days ahead of us. Are, are we doing better than Italy was? Or are we doing worse than Italy was? Oh, what happened in South Africa South, you know, with, with, with Omicron? Oh, well, that's about 60 days ahead of us. Can we expect the same thing? Is it, is it a similar um, surge and then cutoff? So comparing events that don't start at the same time, but pretending as if they did, um, I've shown this a lot, the um, which um, YouTube video got to 1 billion views mm -hmm. fastest. Um, well, they all came out at different times. Well, instead of it being the day they came out, it should be days from when it was first uploaded. And Jeff Schaefer did this wonderful visualization. So the index chart became critical to understanding COVID. Anyone want to guess what the other thing was that I, and, and I kind of gave you a hint when I said, I don't, it, it, it's, it's, it's not so much a chart type as, as opposed to a way to encode data. And that I thought, well, yeah, you, 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 maybe you use this for science, but you don't need this for business. This is not going to go mainstream and boy, it went mainstream. Uh, have I given people enough of a hint? Erica, do you have any idea? I'm trying to. Um... You, are you talking about the one where like the lines start differently at different times? Like well, that's, 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 the that, that's the index chart. Mm -hmm. it, okay. is, even though they started at different times, pretend they all started at the same date. Okay. Um, and that's, that's great for business. Are we doing better than last quarter, even though we're yeah. only... Um, we're only five weeks into the quarter. How do we compare this quarter with last quarter? So an index chart is a phenomenal way to do that. And that's one of the examples that's in the Big Book of Dashboards and you can download from bigbookofdashboards.com. Um, are, are you going with the spiral? <laughs> no, no, I'm not going with the spiral. It's, it's log scales, logarithmic hmm. scales, ah. which becomes it, essential to understanding the rate at which something is... Um, uh, increasing. And you started to see this with uh, John Byrne Murdoch um, in the Financial Times, and uh, it's not on a linear scale. And then you would have these reference lines showing, oh, this is um, uh, this diagonal line of some sort is showing where it's 
doubling every three days, it's doubling every week, it's doubling every two weeks. And it was the only way to understand um, uh, the rate of change. And I never thought log scales would become uh, so mainstream, but they were critical to understanding this data set. Yeah, Steve, uh, Han, you know, Steve, another question that I have for you, maybe it's, you've noticed this what, before when, uh, I used to be in an office and then I'd have to go into a place when, when I build these dashboards, they needed to be in either a uh, letter landscape or letter portrait size, because in case they needed to print it out to take it to a meeting, they needed to have that ability with a lot of things being remote. Now that's not really relevant anymore to be able to print something out virtually. So have you noticed any change in like maybe dashboard size due to the pandemic? The, the, I'm, I'm, that's a really interesting observation and I hadn't thought about it. Um, you know, maybe one of the silver linings is people are printing less, you know, that, that, uh, mm -hmm. um, and I, I've always said that organizations would do way better if they printed less and clicked more and maybe they're doing that. Now, I still wonder Yes, but how is this thing being consumed? Um, is it being consumed on a mobile device or it's, no, everybody's at home. Why would I have to consume it on a mobile device? Uh, I'm not going anyplace. I will consume it on, on my lovely laptop uh, here. And, and to this day, you know, one of the biggest challenges in any of this is creating a dashboard that works effectively on multiple devices. And, and I don't think there's any easy way to do that. And those of you who tackle it, um, I salute you. Yeah, there was um, one question here that says, what is the number one most common mistake with data storytelling? I think that you probably said maybe not, not knowing your audience, right? Maybe that's one. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to default to that. They have yeah. stuff. Hey, Aaron, I'm curious, are you getting requests for different stuff now, uh, um, form factors? Uh, it, it's more of the, you know, when, when we go to build the dasher from, from scratch, it used to be, it had to be a certain size so that they can print it off. And now it's, now the question is, is do you do you make it automatic so it, it's automatic to their screen? But does that mess up your visualization a little bit? Does it need to be PowerPoint size because you know people still use that and they can put it in those slides? So it it all depends on whatever the client, whatever the end user is actually going to use that uh, dashboard for. Just the the, the I, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. If you want to guarantee, um, pro, you know, if you want to create a dashboard that looks horrible on everybody's screen except your own, set it for auto size. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's the, uh, also it, 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 Tableau performance on auto size kind of goes in the crapper as well on uh, stuff. I have not succeeded with auto sizing. Now there are, part of that is because you know, whatever it's algorithm, it's algorithm for auto sizing just isn't really very smart. You know, the fonts don't get bigger or smaller the visualizations get bigger or smaller, but that eight point type is still eight point type. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if it really scaled, that might be a, might have a better solution. And hopefully that's in the, uh, uh, in the pipeline at some point. Mm -hmm. awesome. um, there was another question to say, how do you choose between infographic or a dashboard to present? Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in what um, uh, Pablo Stanley is going to be doing next week. Although I bet he's not making a dashboard, he's using Tableau to create infographics. Mm -hmm. And and, and it, 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 I think infographics, I think Adobe Illustrator, but mm -hmm. the uh, he does wonderful work, and I'm I'm excited that you've got him as a, a as a presenter. Um, really different you know a dashboard is to monitor conditions uh, and or facilitate understanding maybe there's interactivity so people have self-service a infographic is this entire encapsulated story and it, there's probably a lot of visual design to grab an undefined audience into it so i would say the infographic is I don't know who the audience is. 
I need to grab their attention. I'm going to do something that's going to stop and say, please look at this thing. Right. <clears throat> we have one last question here. Um, it says, when do, when do we need an interactive dashboard, but just a base? What questions should we ask the end user to determ determine this? That could be long, right? <laughs> the, 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 I think that's a very, I, you're off to a really great story. Uh, you're mm -hmm. just wondering about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the frustrations you're going to have is you're going to make some amazing stuff and some of your stakeholders aren't going to use your amazing stuff. Um, and for whatever reason, they don't know the degree to which you're making their lives easier. That um, So your stakeholder becoming your collaborator in this can be really potent to making a, a, something really good. So early on, meet with these people and say, hey, I'm prototyping this. Is this helpful? Do you understand how this works? Oh, by the way, I'm adding this capability as well. So here's kind of the, the higher level view. But if you see a little red dot, that means that's an area that probably needs your attention. And I made it that you can just click here and it goes right to that thing that needs your attention. So showing them the combination of I'm making it easy for you to see what's going well problems, and I'm making it easy for you to, to drill down into the problems. If, if they're involved early on, they'll probably, uh, they'll probably take some pride of authorship as they start to see some of their suggestions uh, embedded into the dashboard you create. Hey, I am gonna dig up something as um, um, there's a URL, um, I've got, there are some people out there who have done way better jobs than I have, but I put together something that explains um, log scales and why you need to understand them and why it is, to, 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 why you need to understand them to understand um, the concerns about COVID and why a lot of people are not surprised that you know we have like a million cases a day in the United States or close to it right now. Um, and it has to do with, you all know the, the bit that if you take a penny and double it and then double the two cents and then double the four cents and double the eight cents, so you keep doing this, you know that after 30 days, you have over $5 million. Yes. And it's, and you know, this thing just kind of goes like this and then suddenly out of no place, it just explodes. Well, to people who study infectious disease, this is not a surprise. And that's why they use log scales. I'll find it, um, I'll do it as a follow-up along with um, uh, the PDF, but I've got a, a little movie that will explain uh, exponential growth and why log scales were so needed to help understand uh, the trajectory of uh, COVID. I mean, that, I think that's great because my, me and myself, I was thinking about what, what they are and how to learn more about it. Uh, one of the things that I really like about the, today, you were talking about your presentation was when you said, okay, this dot represents the organization. So including the users into the dashboard, right? That personalization part, like, hey, this is a speaker number 937. I know, I know one of the visualizations you can put the number of the speaker and it will be there in the chart. I know that Aaron and I were super fans of that because it's just increased adoption and makes the user part of the visualization. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, it also takes a lot of design pressures off mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. If you make the, the, the whole viz where your audience is the hero of the story or the mm -hmm. thing that's highlighted mm -hmm. and they want to know, well, where am I with respect to peers to others to where I want to be and they make it very clear um, that people are interested in themselves it's not mm -hmm. that's understandable so agreed I've seen awesome. it work really wonders awesome does anybody else or anybody in the uh, leadership team have any other question Aaron or Katie or Erica or anybody else on the chat I don't know if there's anything on the chat right now uh, Aaron or Aaron. There are no other questions that I can see. No. So, Steve, thank you so much. And we really appreciated all your time today. Uh, 
kind of say anything more than, than thank you so much for this. I mean, this is great for us to start this year. Uh, we're going to have great content and great uh, speakers this year. And starting with you is just an amazing start for the talk, for Florida talk. Uh, so lately, you know, uh, Pablo asked us to be now the Florida talk because there were all these other talks from Miami, Jacksonville, all these other talks that they were maybe not doing anything and or they were just doing it like once a year. And they said, hey, why you guys not now become the Florida Pablo user group? And it's been, you know, honestly, thanks to individuals like Steve that have been with us before. And they can see that we, we have great relationship with individuals like Steve and the other same masters. So thank you to everyone. And, and again, thanks to Steve for, for being with us here. I'm, for, I'm pretty sure everybody learned a lot and it's great, great, amazing information for us. Thank you so much. Oh, man, and it's my pleasure. And what an incredible job this leadership team has done. Uh, I remember where you were mm -hmm. uh, when when you had kind of taken over and yes. where you are now. And you guys kick ass. So um, <laughs> very impressed. And Erica, you, 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 you brought up something about the spiral chart. Um, mm -hmm. So the the um, uh, if somebody wants to dig it up, they can. In any case, I'm like Mr. Boring Bar Chart Guy. So the fact that I'm going, hey, I really like this cow in a chart, mm -hmm. or in the context of this New York Times article, right. Twitter went, the, the, the Twitter had just a giant meltdown mm -hmm. over this odd chart type that was used in an opinion piece. This is maybe two weeks ago. Um, I have since contacted the or one of the authors of the of of the charts, and it's interesting. But we are going to be discussing this tomorrow on yes. chart chat. Chart chat. Um, so um, I'll, I I will send follow up URLs and things like that. Mostly what we're doing tomorrow is just the, the year in review, looking Perfect. at cool stuff from 2021. But um, uh, this this just got so much interest as oh my god how could the times do something that was um so um uh, so unhelpful mm -hmm. and other people going no this is a fantastic chart so mm -hmm. it, it, it should be an interesting discussion so if you're if you're free tomorrow at 11 o'clock eastern hope mm -hmm. you'll join us and i'll i'll share the ur with that yeah, so I think Aaron put it out there. So guys, if anybody can check it out, Chart Chat, amazing, amazing uh, show, amazing content. Don't hesitate to be there tomorrow. I'll be there. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think awesome. we've got here. I've got the, uh, I think that will take you to the right place. Perfect. So Katie. All righty. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Emil, and the rest of the team. And we will see you guys next month. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, all. Thank you, Steve. Have a great day. You too. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Everybody. Thank you, Thank you a lot.